Good morning. This is a little different situation than we're used to, I know. But one thing I want to make sure is that each and every one of us that are gathered together understand the importance of this assembly. This is not about listening to government. This is not about being forced to do something we don't want to do. This is about taking care of one another, first and foremost. Jesus says to love the Lord with all your heart and to love others as you do yourself. I don't want to see anybody get hurt. It's my number one goal here is to be able to encourage you as a friend and as a brother in Christ. And that is why today we're going to do things a little differently. We're sitting in an empty church right now. There's nobody else really sitting around and you're at home. But that doesn't mean that the church is not gathered together. As long as you and I are together. We're one body serving Christ. We invite your family and all those that are your loved ones to come around and be a part of the body of Christ today. We're going to sing hymns. We're going to take time to pray. We are going to be encouraged by God's word. And that is what the church is here to do. Praise God and obey him. Come around his table and come around his throne. And be able to give our very best to him. As you gather together with you and yours this morning. We invite you to be a part of that as well. This morning we are going to start off with victory in Jesus. Our hymn, we're going to start off of glorious celebration in Christ Jesus. Victory in Jesus. Let's sing together with all our hearts geared toward God and serving Him. Victory in Jesus.
This morning's prayer hymn is going to be, It Is Well With My Soul. If you have prayer requests or prayer needs, feel free to share those with us on our Facebook pages at Mount Gilead Christian Church or at Greensburg Christian Church. Or feel free to look me up directly. My name is Brother.Robbie on Facebook. Just look that up. Feel free to send me a message and let me know what your prayer request is. And we'll be glad to pray for it, not just today, but all through the week. And if you need updates on that, please feel free to share those with us. We're going to sing out, It is well with my soul. come to the time of our Lord's Supper celebration. If you uh, partake regularly in the Lord's Supper, the breaking of bread, and the taking of the cup, this is a time for you to take time out and give to your family, to bring the cups and the loaf together, and to be able to remember the price that was paid on Calvary's tree for our sins. If you don't, 
you can sing along with us. We would love to be able to share the good news of Jesus with you through this. As we sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Our study today is going to focus in on the book of Galatians chapter 6 and I want us to think about what Paul is saying to us and proclaims within these words. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6 verse 11 through 14. We are going to talk about boasting only in the cross of Christ. You know, this week has given us a time to sit and really think about what is important to us in this life. We do take so much investment in our jobs, in our hobbies, in our daily living that we might forget the most important thing of all. Those things which are absolutely essential to us. Our time with our family. Our time with those that we care about. Our friends. Not just work colleagues, but friends outside, those people that are of like precious faith. We should never take these for granted. But more importantly, we should never, ever take the cross of Christ for granted. Let's read together Galatians chapter 6, verses 11 through 14. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law. 
but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. It's easy for us to miss the ironic, upside-down nature of this declaration because we are used to hearing about the cross. We think about the cross pretty much every Sunday. We see it in our buildings. We even wear it around our neck. We have sanitized the cross and have stripped away so much of what made the crucifixion so shameful and so violent. It was not a pretty way to die. It was so shameful that it was not spoken about by people. Those who were hung on the tree were cursed. We even get a little uncomfortable if we have to have a long discussion about capital punishment these days. There are 30 states who still use capital punishment and all of them use lethal injection as the primary means of execution. Many of these states also have secondary means if, for any reason, lethal injection is ruled unconstitutional. Why? Why are these, second, why are these secondary means needed? Such as electrocution, lethal gas, hanging, nitrogen hypoxia, firing squad. You see they, that we do not like to talk about or even think about such things. Why do we want to talk about death? We're in a very modern society. We don't need death. We need life. We want life even in our church services. We love hearing about the good part of Jesus. And the good part is about heaven opening up. How wide the gates are and how beautiful it is. We're always afraid to talk about the consequences of sin. And the reality of hell. It was a horrifying way to die on the cross. Far worse than any means our states use today. Now I want us to think about what Paul is saying in this to the Galatian Christians. In context, there are false teachers who are boasting in the very physical acts of going and being circumcised. They are boasting that make these Gentile Christians circumcised. They praised what they were doing. But listen to what Paul says again in verse 14. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice. Notice that Paul does not say that he only will boast in Jesus. That is not what he is saying here. Paul says that he will only boast in the cross of Jesus. Paul will not praise himself. Paul will praise nothing but the cross of Jesus. Now I want you to imagine if our spiritual leader here tried, was tried in a court of law today. Received the death penalty and was executed by our government through capital punishment by means of the electric chair. Who would take pride in the electric chair? Think about that for a moment. How would you respond to seeing somebody put into the electric chair? We look back at people like Ted Bundy, who was placed in the electric chair. We look at what kind of scathing criminal he was. And we view him as a wicked man. But... What if he was Jesus? I'm not saying that by any means that Ted or Jeffrey Dahmer or any of the like should be put up there on the pedestal of Christ. None of us are holy. None of us are blessed enough to be considered sinless until we come to know Jesus. Who would go and praise somebody in the electric chair. Who would go and praise somebody who was killed during a firing squad or put into the gas chamber? Yet that is exactly what Paul proclaims to boast in here. Paul is saying, quite frankly, 
the capital punishment didn't fit the crime. But he is owing everything he has to that punishment. Paul will not boast in himself at all. Paul will not boast in what he does at all. His joy, his glory, his praise, and his boast is only in the execution device to kill our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul goes on further to explain what he means here and what this looks like so we can understand why this would be all that Paul would boast in. Why do you boast in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul? What is the problem here? He's Lord. Why not boast in Him alone? He tells us that the world has been crucified to Him and He has been crucified to the world. His boast is in the cross because the world has been crucified to Him. The world has been put to the cross. What does that mean? It means nothing has power over Paul now. Not money, not possessions, not sex, not power, not reputation, not authority, or anything else has power over him. The world and all it represents is dead to him. Put to the side. Gone. The cross is the power to free us from the slavery of this world. The world no longer pulls us or rules over us. We no longer have a compelling interest in the things of this world. Nor should we. We are just dead to it. We, we glory in the fact that we want no part of the world. That all we want is Jesus. All we want is Jesus. And that is exactly what Paul said a little earlier in the letter when he says in Galatians 5.24, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have, been crucifi have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now we've got to ask ourselves, this is true to us. Could we say what the apostle says here in the world being crucified to us? Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Why is that so difficult? Seems easy to say, right? Think about this week. Were you concerned about this virus? Were you concerned that maybe there were other factors involved? I've heard many, many things going on. It's a government conspiracy. I've heard this was an attack by China. I've heard so many things. But that's not what this is about. This is not at all about those remarks. This is about fear. What are we afraid of? We get so anxious and so tore up. Oh my goodness. We could, we, could, we could hurt ourselves. We could hurt our families. I know. I worry about my family too. Every day I worry about and pray for my family. And I want to see them taken care of. And I know you want to see your family taken care of too. But there are bigger things to be afraid of. Bigger than viruses. Bigger than countries. Bigger than leaders. We need to be afraid of the one who can kill body and soul. Straight from Jesus' lips. And we need to be focused on that. And that is why it is so important for us to put our fears and our worries aside. And to be able to take comfort in the blessing of the cross. It is the cross that we nail the worries and doubts and fears of this world on. 
We don't have to be held back. I know how hard it is. Because I suffer from the anxiety. I suffer, I suffer from the worry and doubt. I know. We all do. But we burden, we share the burden together. We work together to build ourselves in the likeness of Christ. We give Him all of our worries. That's why I ask for each one of us to pray for one another quite often. Paul says to pray without ceasing. And so we should. That's why it can be difficult at times. You know, the idea of carrying our cross and crucifying our desires and passions can be seen as difficult. I believe that there are a couple reasons there. First, we don't see it as slavery. We don't see it that way. We're not enslaved to these passions or desires. We think we're doing just what we want to do. The problem is we deceive ourselves into thinking that that's the true joy and true living. It's not the case. It's something more. We deceive ourselves into thinking that's the good stuff. But consider how this is actually slavery. You're captured by a desire or passion that you do not have control of. All sin falls into that category. It doesn't have to be just the addictions. It doesn't have to be the bad things that we think about, the big bads, all them big sins. It can be the little sins like worry, doubt, gossip. Those things count too. You no, know, I've been blessed with some folks in the congregations here and one of them told me once, she looked right at me and says, Robbie, do you believe what Acts 2.38 says? I said, yes. She said, quote it. And I did. And she said, now, you believe in what Matthew 6, 31 says? And I said, yes. Now, if you don't know what Matthew 6, 31 says, it's simply Jesus saying, don't be anxious in anything. Trust in him. Put your cares on him. If he's going to feed birds, if he's going to clothe the lilies of the field, he's going to take care of you too. She said, don't be anxious. Be ready. I couldn't say it any better. We all fall short. Every single one of us. And that is why it is important for us to allow God to control, not ourselves. We'll make the determination ourselves, oh, well, it's fine, when it may not be. Allow me to illustrate with a consuming sin, sexuality. You have a marriage, but rather than find joy or fulfillment in that marriage, your body is consumed with finding a substitute. Rather than investing in your marriage, you take on a cheap alternative. Maybe you go and you cheat on your wife or your husband. Maybe you go into the arms of a co-worker or a lady of the evening. Rather than have someone who has made a covenant to stay with you for life, you seek pleasure through strangers and acquaintances, ignoring the very blessing God's given you. I hope that many of you are doing exactly what our family is doing. Sitting around the supper table. Talking to one another. Praying with one another. Spending time with one another. During this quarantine. During these times when we are to be at home. That we spend time with those we love. And actually talk to them. Not talk at them. Talk to them. Talk with them. Share with them. My beautiful wife came up with a wonderful idea every night to go and to take time out for each member of the family, even little Livy, who's five years old, to share one positive thing that happened during the day. 
you, would believe, you wouldn't believe some of the beautiful things you hear around that table. Don't rely on the outside sources. Don't rely on this world to give you comfort. It won't. Trust in the Lord and trust in Him. The second reason we do not crucify the flesh is pretty similar to the very first reason. We love our sin. We often want to describe our sin as overpowering to us. The only reason sin has power over us is because we love it. Our love for our sin gives its power. It is not greater than us. It has not overpowered us. We have empowered it because we love it. We love our anger, out of bitter, our bitterness, our malice, our desires, our passions, our immorality and our sin, whatever it is. Remember that James tells us that we are tempted by our own desires in James 1.14. The apostle John declares that the problem is that we love the darkness more than we do the light. So how do we overcome that? We need a new affection. We need to have a greater love for something else. Power over sin doesn't come by knowledge alone, but by a love for the Savior that is so great that it displaces our love for sin. This is not, no, there is no great motivation that we have in our lives, no greater one. Than love. Love is what drives a parent into a burning building to rescue the child. Love is more powerful than any other influence. So, what will develop our love for Jesus to be greater than our love for this world? What will be the source? The source of that amazing love God displays is the very cross of Jesus Christ. The reason. Why we expose the scriptures, digging deeply into what God says line by line, is because this word shows us love. Each and every step shows love. The, world, the word reveals the cross, and the cross reveals God's relentless, unwavering love. The more we see His love, the more we love Him in return. The greatest command is to love the Lord because it is the fuel of our service. It is the embodiment of our worship and in our obedience. Love for the Lord will drive all other desires and afflictions away. When we see that sin has wrecked our lives and enslaved us to our passions... We now look at Jesus and His cross in a completely different way. As a means by which we have hope. That the cross, the bloody, angry, bitter, wooden cross. With its splinters, daggers, holding into Jesus' flesh. Pulling it from His body. Those nails that held His hands and feet in place. That picture, that image in your head, you see it, don't you? It's not the pretty polished crosses we have today. It's the old rugged cross. <coughs> you see, the world has been crucified to us. We have been crucified to the world. Paul also says that he is crucified to the world. In short, you are dead to this world. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ today, you shouldn't be continuing on in the life who you were before you got to know Jesus. You should be better. You should be stronger. 
you should be serving Jesus. And you should be focused and living in His kingdom. You do not live in America. Your life, your concern, your hope is not in the country, it's not in the culture, it's not in your race, it's not in your ethnicity, it's not in your background, in your parents, in your friends, in your spouse, in your president, or anything else that's physical here. Yes, it's okay to believe in certain things. It's okay to be in a political party. It's okay to love mom and dad and apple pie and baseball and America. It's fine. But it should not be your only priority. It should be secondary to Christ's kingdom. That is your only concern. Paul used the picture to the Philippians that our citizenship is in heaven. Check Philippians chapter 3 verse 20. It says it right there. And it is important that we recognize that. Our hope is not in capitalism. It is not in socialism. It's not in democracy. It's not in our next election. Our, our boasting, our hope, our everything is in nothing but Jesus crucified for us. That is all that matters. And that is all that we should live for. Those are some pretty scary words. You mean I've got to be a radical? Yeah. Remember those 12 disciples that followed Jesus, right? 11 of them died for their beliefs. And one, the last one, John, was put on an island out in the middle of nowhere. So he couldn't even talk to anybody. Yet he did not waver in his faith at all. None of them did. Why? Because a disciple does not live for anything else in this world. We don't live for our job. We don't live for our children. We don't live for our spouse. We don't live for anyone except Jesus. And the world sees that because we have been crucified to this world. We are dead to it. We glory in the fact that we are connected to Jesus Christ. And not the ebbs, the shifts, the wanings of this world. The cross was not something Paul wanted to escape, but wanted to glory in, wanted to embrace, wanted to be one with. So much so that he said that I have been crucified with it. The only glory that matters is that we are dead to the world and alive in Jesus. We are no longer desperate for favor in this world. Further, all self-glorifying is dead. The cross represents the means of our redemption. The cross is the way that we are forgiven. Our prayer is for us to be kept near the cross. Because... The cross is the display of God's love for us. According to Romans 5. That cross represents our decisive break from this world and its desires. The cross represents our love and His love for us. You see, our love should not be in ourselves so that we can boast about what we do. Like these false teachers in Galatians were doing. Our love is in Jesus and His cross so that we boast only in Him. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have been crucified, have crucified the flesh with their passions, with their desires, according to Galatians 5.24. The only way to crucify the flesh and its desires is to love Jesus and His cross more than we do those things we cling to. 
we're not on the cross, we cannot boast in the cross. This morning, I know that there are people at home that believe in the fullness and loving grace of Jesus Christ. And I am so thankful that there are believers, that there are people who walk true in their faith and who obey the gospel every day. But I know that there are also those who choose not to. Those that may have disagreements with what Scripture says or what the church believes in. Don't listen to this preacher. Listen to God's Word. Listen to what God's Word says. Believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God. That's the first step in understanding and taking a, being a part of the cross. Understanding that Jesus died on the cross for you. He died, was buried, and resurrected for you. For me. For the world. Not just a select few. Everybody. Your sin is not greater than anybody else's. And that's one of the great blessings we have. Maybe you need to repent. Maybe you need to seek His face. Believing in Jesus Christ is the first step. Repenting is that second one. Being willing to say, I've sinned and I've fallen away and I want to come home, Father. To turn around just like the prodigal son did. God meets you halfway there too. He waits for you to call Him Father and confess Him before men. Confessing Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God and the means by which you are saved. But you aren't going to get anywhere until you become one in the cross, in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That is why baptism is so important. Baptism is the point where God does His work within you. Just as He did in lifting Christ Out of the grave, so too He lifts you out of the grave of the old man and into new life. You can check Colossians 2.12 on that. That's God's work, not ours. It's not the preacher's work. It's not the person's work. It's God's work. Let God do the work in you. And instill His Holy Spirit within you. And finally, don't give up. After you've been baptized, walk in the newness of life. Keep seeking His face in all things. Keep growing in Christ. Take time to do that today. We're going to sing out the invitation hymn, I Surrender All. If you've got a decision this morning, let it be known. Tell your neighbors. Tell your friends. Call preachers. Call me. Share what you want to do. If you want, I'll meet you wherever. We'll get you baptized in the name of Jesus to walk in the newness of life, to obey the gospel message. But you've got to be willing to do that this day. Take time out to do that. I surrender all.